In questo caso abbiamo Marco De Benedictis e Francesco Beltramini che ci racconteranno ehm, come utilizzare eh, Kubernetes. Faccio una piccola introduzione in inglese perché loro presenteranno in inglese e dopo che lascio la parola a loro. Um, so, scalability uh, in this case is a very difficult uh, topic. Um, Renaissance is the symbol of freedom and love for the nature. Uh, innovation and culture enhancement. Uh, in these modern times, the Renaissance came through Kubernetes, uh, making enterprise architecture um, more reliable and secure. So let's discover how to act Kubernetes for large scale deployments with Marco de Benedictis and Francesco Beltramini, security engineer. So welcome to the speakers. Grazie. Grazie Serena. Vediamo delle slide. Perfetto. Eh, buongiorno a tutti. Um, siamo Marco e Francesco. Um, abbiamo deciso di fare questa presentazione in inglese non perché vogliamo tirarcela, ma è perché eh, abitualmente parliamo, siamo una, una, una consultancy basata a Londra, per cui ne parliamo sempre in inglese e troveremo molto difficile tradurre al volo in italiano. Um, Benvenuti, benvenuti a Hacking the Kubernetes Renaissance. Um, vi cerchiamo di mostrare una metodologia per diminuire il rischio um, in fase di design e di deployment di, uh, di cluster Kubernetes, uh, quello che noi applichiamo tutti i giorni um, nel nostro lavoro e spero che vi possa essere utile che vi portiate a casa qualcosa di interessante. Partiamo da... cambiamo in inglese adesso, Marco. Ok, uh, good morning everybody. A uh, couple of words about us. Uh, I'm Marco, I'm a cloud security uh, engineer in control plane. I've been here for the last, I guess, seven months. Um, before that, I have kind of a um, background in academia. I've been involved in uh, Politecnico di Torino as a security researcher for uh, a number of years. Did a PhD there and then uh, uh, last uh, Three plus years I've been involved in uh, IT security consulting, both for public and private sectors uh, in Italy and now with Control Plane. Uh, right now I'm really focusing on cloud native, everything cloud native. So Kubernetes is, uh, of course, a big part of what I do on a daily basis. And uh, yeah, I'm also, I, I work a lot with threat modeling that we will see today. And good morning, all. I'm Francesco. I'm the security engineering manager for Control Plane. Um, spent a significant number of years in academia, uh, Verona. And then I moved uh, uh, to London in 2011. Uh, was working for the European government uh, for a few years uh, on data security, network security, and crypto management. And since then, in 2015, and then moved to a company called Immersat. Uh, um, Satcom business, uh, so satellite mobile provider. I uh, cover different roles. Uh, um, chief engineer for the satellite control center. Then I moved into, um, I was head of security operations engineering. So security ops uh, uh, and all the platforms enabling uh, that delivery. And then uh, security, uh, head of security engineer, engineering. So um, the team would also consult the internal views on a number of projects. And then last year I joined control plane. Um, The, the, the team I manage is uh, 13 consultants, a uh, very highly skilled individual um, in the security architecture, security engineering, and pen test uh, domains. Marco, next. Brief mention of who Control Plane is. Um, we are, again, a cloud data security consultancy um, established in 2017. Although we are headquartered in London, we have operations in uh, North America, most of the European countries. Uh, Uh, of course, the UK and then APAC. We are, uh, our core uh, focus is uh, cloud native security, Kubernetes and container security in general. Our customer range uh, spans from uh, governments to financial services. And in general, we like to work with uh, uh, regulated industries. Next. Uh, a quick shout to the book written by our, our CEO, Andy Martin, uh, published by O'Reilly, Hacking Kubernetes. Uh, Um, you can scan that QR code at the top uh, of the screen that gives you um, access to the first half of the uh, digital edition for free. The first half, if I'm not mistaken, is the offensive security. 
uh, which is probably the, you know the cool one. Uh, please uh, download it. Uh, um, I think it's an excellent publication uh, regarded to as the the Bible of Kubernetes security. Next. Again, uh, very quickly, our core competencies, we uh, assist customers in cloud data transformations. We um, hinged on threat model. We also consult on uh, Kubernetes and container security in general. We are large advocates of zero trust architectures. We look after also um, customers uh, as they try to integrate uh, Kubernetes clusters of different sizes running on different CSPs uh, um, with their security op centers. And we also threat model and build for them um, CICD pipelines. And uh, more recently, we, uh, last thing, but well, it's actually here, that's fine. Um, more recently, we uh, also uh, focu start focusing very much on supply chain security, open source ingestion. Uh, again, we do also hands-on pen testing on all the above. Next, please, Mark. Again, a quick summary of our uh, community contribution. Um, our CEO, Andy Martin, is also the pro bono CISO for Open UK. Um, we are members of the FinTech Open Source Foundation, or FINOS. We also contribute to the um, Financial Services User Group of CNCF. Um, and then, uh, yes, we are also uh, the co-chair for the security technical, for the TAG, for the Security Technical Advisory Group. Um, next, please, Marco. Okay, so what will we be talking about today? And then I'll leave the floor to my esteemed colleague. Uh, why do we talk about the Kubernetes uh, uh, Renaissance? Um, and in, from there, we will start talking about what are the most common adoption risks we see um, happening or you know, uh, possible in the, uh, in the wild where we consult for customers. And then again, to navigate through that problem space uh, uh, we will provide a threat modeling uh, approach uh, into threat modeling Kubernetes. Uh, we will then wrap up uh, by um, giving core, uh, providing a list of core security considerations and principles to be taken into account when trying to secure large-scale deployments. Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, let's start from the from the question: of Why we call it Renaissance, right? Uh, so. Um, we know that Kubernetes has been around for a few years now, and uh, it's kind of the de facto standard for cloud native application deployments anyway. But more recently, as security professionals, we, we've also seen a shift in the way the technology is consumed as uh, uh, Kubernetes is stepping up to be the backbone of large enterprise IT infrastructures. And uh, this is not only limited to deploying applications in a scalable way, right? Uh, as now we use Kubernetes to drive ops, uh, build pipelines, enforce policies across the organization, collect metrics. So this kind of represents a renewal of the platform scope from the security standpoint. So the uh, security challenges that come with it have uh, significantly changed, especially as large organizations are heavily investing on, on the technology. So uh, from, from our perspective, this really calls for uh, a systematic approach to be introduced in order to understand uh, threats to the platform, derive controls so that we can effectively lower the risk, especially <coughs> sorry, when we are talking about uh, production environments. And that's what we are going to, to present here. So first part, I'd say, uh, in order to define this systematic approach, let's start addressing the risk. And to do that, uh, let's look into our problem space here, right? Uh, so uh, here we all know that our problem space on, on Kubernetes is, uh, is very large because uh, Kubernetes deployments can be really complex and are multidimensional. And uh, uh, that's not really only about technology as they have people involved. And uh, uh, the first thing that security tells us is uh, people are often the, the weakest link or the biggest threat uh, without or without any intent. So uh, this, this for us is very important because every blind spot, uh, non-deterministic behavior uh, that's introduced by people uh, we need to manage. And uh, I said we, uh, on purpose, we, we will say later why, because this is a collaborative effort in a way. So uh, when, when you look at this problem space, for me, it's very uh, important to look at it from the people standpoint. So the different teams interacting with, uh, with each of these, uh, uh, of the layers that make Kubernetes deployment. So uh, as app developers, first thing, uh, of course, we are concerned about containers, pods, 
that make our applications and how they interact with each other. So here we already have a bunch of things to discuss. Uh, how do we manage our own uh, built images? Uh, are we aware of the dependencies that we bring uh, in our supply chain? Uh, do we apply any kind of container best practices, baselines uh, to, uh, to our images? And uh, do we actually have a way to ensure that that's being done? So we are enforcing any kind of control on that. And uh, what actually happens if someone, either by mistake or on purpose, puts any malicious code in our, in our software? So these are already a significant number of, of questions and risks that come with it. Uh, but that's just a start. So as a DevOps team, uh, we should care about how the workloads are actually configured in the cluster, right? So we should care about privileges we grant them. Uh, for example, if we are running privileged containers, uh, this might introduce significant attack vectors in our own uh, infrastructure. Uh, so we have to, to take a lot of care about that. Uh, but Pods are not the only thing we should care, right? Uh, we should consider also the underlying container runtime, how we persist data, how we identify our workloads. And uh, full disclosure on this, uh, base configurations are really not secure by default. So there's always an effort uh, that we need to put together with the different teams to help secure uh, this whole mess, to be fair. Um, let's go on with the platform infrastructure teams and that's where the, uh, the situation becomes even more complicated. Here, we actually care about cluster configuration across our development teams. Uh, so that includes access control, network segregation for all of our application deployments. And also, uh, what about the control plane APIs for our clusters? Because we know they are the most significant part of, uh, of the information is held there. So uh, do we restrict access from uh, unauthorized users? both in and outside our network. Uh, do we have any kind of, I don't know, dashboards running? How are we securing them? How's the access control gonna work for them? So that, that's a lot of, of questions. And, and actually that's not all. So uh, now the difficult question, uh, did we actually design the cluster thinking with a security by design approach? So what's, what about the network topology of our cluster, identity services? Uh, how is the encryption configured for our ETCD database? Is it running on separate servers or uh, within our cluster? So these are, these are a lot of questions we need to answer. And finally, uh, you see here in the, in the bottom of the slide, uh, do we trust a cloud provider? Do we run it in our own infrastructure? How's the skill set on that? And uh, all these questions really make the problem space kind of scary. And uh, yeah, that's the way it is. So, I say we move forward, but actually there's still a point to be made here, uh, which is really uh, very important in the design phase. And that's the uh, operating model that we actually choose for our clusters. Uh, here, we typically see in our customers either self-service approach where you have developers, DevOps team that uh, have a lot of power with infrastructure as code, service catalogs to really build their own applications. And that's very good for agility for them, but really from the security standpoint, this uh, makes, makes up a lot of duplications, a lot of misalignments in configurations from the security standpoint. So the design might change a lot from, from cluster to cluster. And uh, of course, as an alternative, you might have central platform team, uh, which manages the whole fleet of, uh, of clusters in a large deployment. Uh, that of course makes it, the clusters a lot more consistent easier to, to assess from the security standpoint. But uh, of course, as we all know, this might introduce friction between the developers teams, latency as well. So it has to be managed. Uh, finally, I briefly touched on this already. Uh, we have to care about whether we choose a managed or self-hosted solution for our cluster. There are different degrees of uh, uh, responsibility between us and the cloud provider, as you, as you know. Uh, in this regard, actually, we typically see a lot of benefits in, uh, in the managed solution, uh, unless there are regulatory constraints which, uh, which make you uh, decide otherwise. But oh, we will discuss a bit, more, uh, a bit further on this in, uh, in some slides. So I say, for now, I'm done. Floor is yours again, Francesco. Mm, and, thank uh, you. Yeah. Again, this is an, uh, an attempt uh, to um, explain how large the problem space can get in uh, in five minutes. I hope you appreciated how many considerations have to be made. And 
going back to the diagram marker showed you uh, there are many similarities when we were you know back in the days back in the day trying to secure the osi model right uh, all the seven layers of the of a networking stack again non-trivial problems so and what do we do about this problem so the we don't use cube, but it's a little late for that. Um, we use it, but we don't really care about uh, those considerations and uh, those countermeasures. Um, or we try to secure everything, which you know you know better. It's uh, um, impossible to do. So then our approach uh, is uh, we threat model Kubernetes, and we get very good at it. And in the same time, we also develop uh, and adopt standards, best practices. Uh, reference architectures, including patterns and anti-patterns, and we keep improving them. So um, again, we started from a, um, a quick overview of how complex the issue can be. And now we want to offer you a, a methodology, just again, bringing um, our experience on the table um, to threat model Kubernetes. And um, next, please. So just a, a, a quick reminder for those of you uh, who doesn't remember, um, what is threat modeling? Again, a systematic approach, as Marco said. Everybody should be at the same. Uh, everyone, actually, I mentioned to Dion, should be at the same table. Uh, security folks, developers, uh, IT managers, uh, ops guys, uh, even the exec team. Um, it's uh, more informal, doesn't have uh, uh, hard requirements um, on an established risk framework within the company. Uh, it should happen early in the design and build processes. Uh, uh, it focuses very much on data, uh, its classification, how toxic, toxic this get, data can get if uh, leaked or live in the premises. And it focuses very much on data flows. Fundamentally, aids in finding and addressing security risk. But, um, and this is why we like it, it derives very tactical and, tactical and actionable data. We can leave a, a, a three days workshop by providing a threat model and a threat report that teams can consume straight away. And uh, the output of our the threat model exercise takes the form of attack trees uh, and security controls and countermeasures. Next. So the process, again, is an iterative process, uh, four steps. Uh, and step one, we ask ourselves, well, what are we building? In step two, we ask ourselves, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, doomsday scenarios. And step three, we ask ourselves, uh, how can we actually reduce uh, the risk of these bad things happening. And then in step four, we measure ourselves. We we try to understand if we did a good job. So in step one, um, there are some key considerations. Uh, scope is probably the most important thing of all. Um, if you don't scope well the threat model exercise, the, um, the, 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 the complexity explodes. It gets uh, too wide. Um, Try to scope it down to what really matters to you, to what the com critical components are for you of your cluster. Uh, if, for example, the, the cluster serves a, a large audience, uh, threat model, uh, everything that has to do with RBAC, Arcus control. Um, if um, you have data regulate your um, constraints imposed by regulatory um, uh, compliance, uh, um, scope it uh, on data and where the nodes are going to be. Um, business impact array, um, is critical. Again, it has to be useful to the techies, but also to the business, business users themselves. Uh, the threat model has to be understandable. And for that, you need to assess uh, an imp the impact against the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and articulate it in a way they can understand. And again, um, a lot of focus on use cases uh, has to be something useful. This threat model has to be something useful. So understand what actually Kubernetes is going to be used for, uh, including the operating model. So who is operating it? Who uh, is consuming and maintaining the cluster? And the larger the cluster, the more complex uh, the operating model can get. Uh, again, I can't stress enough the importance uh, to, if, it's, if it gets too complicated, too complex, uh, scope it down build a threat model for the control plane, build a threat model for something else, scope it down to the components again that you deem as more uh, critical. Uh, don't lose the full picture, of course. Um, reference, uh, cross-reference th uh, threat models, um, because maybe something which is not particularly impactful in one threat model, together with something else in another threat model, which is not particularly impactful, the two together can be doomsday scenarios. So never lose that sort of a big picture, uh, cross-reference those uh, threat models for, to identify toxic combinations. And step two, 
uh, that's the fun part. Um, we sit at a table and we start. Uh... Yeah, well, I think we are having technical issues. So yeah, I will, I will, I will go on from here. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, on, uh, Francesco will be will be joining again. Uh, the the Wi-Fi probably in the office is not good <laughs> today. Sorry, guys. Uh, so yeah, I, as Francesco was saying, first thing is uh, when we when we actually sit on the table with uh, with our customers, we start looking for scenarios which are starting point for the threat model, and uh, these threat these scenarios are really only useful to start defining attack paths that can be uh, implemented based on the actual infrastructure and set of controls that the customer is already in place. So that has to be taken into consideration, of course, in order to understand if a threat can be exploited or not. Uh, starting from there, uh, we, we have a list of threats, we have an attack path, and then we tend to visualize those paths as uh, uh, attack trees. Uh, these are very useful, uh, and we will see that in a moment, because they really help in, uh, as I said, visualize what's the, what's the attack path. Uh, Francesco? I can business. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I I just came in for this slide. I just finished on this. So I think we can go on the next one. Cool. Thank you very much, Marco. No uh, worries. <clears throat> again, quick overview of what the threat actors are. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are some uh, tables like the like that uh, available to you. They try to capture um try to capture different uh, uh, attackers based on how um skillful they are, their motivation, their usual capabilities and what the um, attacks uh, from the from the state of the art might look like. Uh, again, use that as a reference. Most of them might not be applicable to you. Some of them will be. Next, please. Again, um, how do we identify potential threats? Again, it's not only the security guys. Many people at the table will have input, right? We'll be able to um, ask, just ask them what keeps them uh, uh, awake at night very likely that's the right direction to identify those threats and um, prioritize those. Again, the most impactful one, the most dangerous to your business uh, and based again on the cluster or clusters you are building. Uh, once again, don't reinvent the wheel. There are many threat intelligence sources out there, frameworks, uh, established frameworks you can use, uh, Lockheed Martin kill chain, Mitre attack. Uh, there are many tools uh, you can use out there. Uh, we use a lot, of, uh, actually we wrote them, uh, CNCF financial services attack vectors and profile those threats based on well-known frameworks. Again, Stride, Pasta, Dread, Don't Revelt the Wheel. Participate to the open source uh, uh, intelligence community. You will find uh, many organizations with your same challenges. And again, uh, you can uh, you, you can get a lot of reusable collateral from from those uh, from attending those uh, um, uh, groups uh, or uh, initiatives. So next, please. Right then, ultimately, we want to derive something tactical, and we derive attack trees. Um, attack trees again. Uh, uh, representation of potential infiltration vectors. Uh, they are built on uh, um, logical conditions. So what should happen and happen or happen to make something successful uh, or to be for something to be exploitable. Um, uh, attack trees can also be augmented with uh, um, information on likelihood and impact uh, um, of this scenario. And uh, then all we want to do one thing. Ultimately, we want to derive uh, security controls uh, to mitigate individual steps. So to break that attack chain and make that attack more, compli more complicated to perform, to be performed or uh, not feasible at all. Just a word of caution, um, attack trees can get quite complex. Um, again, if they become unmanageable and you have difficulties in navigating through those trees or too many controls to select, uh, scope it down, uh, go back to the table, define a smaller scope, uh, aka smaller attack trees, uh, and eventually cross-reference those threat models. So uh, step three of the threat model process, again, we ask ourselves, how can we reduce uh, the risk of bad things happening? And as I said, ultimately, we want to identify preventative and detective security controls. Um, and on top of that, or together with that, we want to use uh, um, industry standards, um, security standards and architectures, establish um, architect well-designed architectures to ensure um, the completeness for the control set and those principles. Of course, again, there is an ocean of controls out there. Um, prioritize selecting the controls based on the most impactful scenarios. Again, try to 
you know, break those attack chains first, and then based on how much money you have. Uh, often the budget is um, allocated every year, plan in advance, uh, um, again, uh, looking at the most impactful threats and ask for the money to get the technologies uh, or the resources or, or, or the, you know, the people to implement uh, those controls to, bl to block those uh, uh, attack chains. And then step four, we uh, ask ourselves, did we do a good job? We try to measure uh, the effectiveness of our threat model. Um, so we understand the um, residual risk. Uh, again, risk uh, hardly gets to zero uh, in these situations. And then we um, actually build test suites to make sure the uh, effective implementation of our security controls uh, uh, can withstand those attacks we are trying to defend against. And then we uh, eventually do pen test for some um, more high profile threats. Um, we see what those bad guys can do. And then we revise that model. So we keep uh, situational awareness against uh, uh, the you know, ever evolving threat landscape. And we add those applicable threats back in our threat model. And guess what? We start again. So it's an iterative process. Uh, you choose the, the cycle, can be done every six months, can be done every year, whatever. It depends on your business uh, and how much resources you have. Right, I'll uh, now leave uh, the floor to Marco. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesco. So yeah, I have more or less five minutes, so I'll, I'll try to be as quick as possible on this last part. Uh, yeah, as we just said, uh, there's a bunch of risks that we need to address. Problem space is kind of huge. But uh, yeah, as Francesco said, we also have a practical process that we can actually put in place in our uh, in all our enterprises and to, to start defining threats, prioritize controls based on them. So now let's lead, dig a little deeper on how we actually can enforce security controls once threat modeling has uh, happened. So on this side, uh, there's a lot of things to consider. Let's start from... Uh, from the design phase once again. Uh, you remember the question regarding managed versus self-hosted. Here, we might want to consider risk as the guiding factor once again. Uh, bear in mind, control plane uh, in Kubernetes holds the keys to the kingdom. So any cloud provider typically has some form of control over it. Uh, but on this regard, beware that managed solutions tend to uh, hide control plane from the user, but uh, they are not really securing it on their own. There's still hardening to, to be done so that the attack surface can be effectively minimized. An example here for the technical people would be, let's take like a GKE cluster. Uh, we all know that master authorized networks, private endpoints, private clusters, infrastructure aware proxy are all configurations we need to add to actually, for example, reduce the visibility for our control plane APIs. So there's still work to be done on that. Uh, when we go, when you think about distributions, here you might want to choose distribution over another for Kubernetes and uh, uh, based also on the available skill set. Uh, we know there's uh, 60 plus compliant distributions. Some of them are more opinionated on security tooling. Uh, some names might include uh, Fury, uh, Rancher Kubernetes Engine. They have security tooling available. So if, if you feel not that comfortable with implementing uh, security stack, you might want to look into those as well. Uh, what about baselines? Well, CIS benchmarks exist, uh, so just use them, but understand that they are a starting point, so uh, they won't protect on their own for uh, all the attack vectors that you might have. And ultimately, uh, when we think about design, uh, security by design, security by default should be guiding principles, shouldn't be buzzwords. So how do we actually achieve them? Uh, Marco, before you move on, just a quick yeah. shout out. We, we were actually contracted by Google to write the CIS benchmarks for uh, GCP, GKE. So um, if you have any question in that sense, the controls we selected and how I, they are implemented, uh, reach out to us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to. I, di I didn't remember to, to, to say that, but <laughs> thanks, Francesco. Uh, uh, let's go on. Uh, yeah, let, let's think about how we actually implement uh, security by um, by design. Uh, I say that on this, uh, we can start by having everything as code, right? Uh, which means version code. Uh, this has, doesn't really only help DevOps, but security ops as well. And why is that? Well, 
uh, we need our large scale deployments to be as deterministic automated as possible so that we can actually address risks and violations upon uh, actionable technical blueprints rather than on live systems, which are way more complex to, to address. So uh, as security um, people, we, we really we really like this approach. And uh, with policies as code, you can version, test in isolation your policies, audit the individual rules. You can more easily assess the security posture of the infrastructure once it's a, it has been defined as code, even against any kind of compliance rules. And uh, as a whole, code makes it really easier to assess the security posture from the from the beginning. So that's that's something that we that we really like. This is a, a case study, practical case study. I will uh, very briefly uh, talk about um, based on with what we just said. Uh, this is a kind of typical technology stack in 2022 for cloud native companies that are really investing in in Kubernetes. Uh, and here uh, I just mentioned policy as code. Uh, this is where this example we have like Kyverno uh, coming into place, which is uh, some of you might know him, is a policy engine uh, um, that is uh, um, native to Kubernetes, can really help us in uh, admitting resources on the cluster only if they match some conditions. And in this, uh, in this study, uh, we see like a migration to, to open policy agents, although we know uh, that that typically has a more complex policy language, but in a large scale deployment, it can really help as it can help generalize security policies across different systems, not only Kubernetes. Uh, as far as infrastructure goes, case studies based on Kubernetes deployment managed through Terraform. Not much more to add on that. It's a very popular tool around uh, infrastructure as code. With respect to pipelines, there are many tools available. Here we see a migration to uh, Tekton which is another Kubernetes native uh, uh, pipeline tool, uh, which uh, uh, we choose not only for being native to Kubernetes, but uh, we, because together with its uh, Tekton Chains controller that some of you might know, doesn't really allow only to declare the build pipelines, but also to uh, sign, cryptographically sign the runs of the pipelines, snapshot them so that we can uh, even attest them. Uh, that, that goes into the assurance field, supply chain, uh, security field that we didn't go much in detail here. We don't have time available for that, but here you see additional toolings like uh, Spire, Sigstore, which are all available for workload identity, signing software, and can help in implementing assurance in your, uh, in your infrastructure. So I'll try to be as quick as possible on this slide, which I think is uh, it's kind of it's kind of important, but we'll be fast on this. Uh, when Take you your time. I think we still have a uh, two three minutes, so yeah, okay. This this one is important. Yeah, this uh, this slide is actually it's kind of yeah it's it's very important for us because this really represents the different uh, elements, different layers of controls that uh, uh, we typically have to to implement in our customers' infrastructure, or we have to to ask them to implement. And uh, as you can see, we we define them both for uh, the design infrastructure part, for the runtime part as well. And there's there's many, actually. Uh, we start from uh, uh, node hardening, uh, which might involve patching uh, hardening images. Then we have to carefully consider encryption uh, alongside networking. Uh, we know these uh, network policies are good. They can help in uh, sta start segregating namespaces, but there's also service meshes. So we, want, we might want to look into pod to pod encryption, authentication, which all help reducing risk of lateral movement. Then regarding secrets, we know plain Kubernetes secrets are kind of insecure anyway. So we, you better think about external secret solutions. I won't make names here, but there are many out there. And uh, yeah, these, are, these have to be managed very carefully depending on the, the actual use case. Uh, as far as runtime goals, uh, we should adopt uh, as much as possible secure defaults for our security modules, implement non root policies, implement addition control, admission control, sorry, especially now that uh, pod security policies have been deprecated. So uh, it actually, are actually removed in 1.25. Uh, uh, so we should either consider upgrading to pod security standards with uh, the newly pod security admission uh, controller, or might want to look into custom policy controllers such as Open Policy Agent, Gatekeeper, Caverno, which I just mentioned earlier. And then, of course, same old vulnerability scanning, observability issues. We still have them, 
even in a Kubernetes environment. So in this case, we should scan our images, our runtime, we should log our activities, audit every kind of administrative activity, and even be able to escalate everything that comes uh, as suspicious to the appropriate security operation center or equivalent if needed. So these are all concerns that we have to, to on which we have to enforce controls. Final slide on this, which is very quick. Uh, why are we so interested in really layering security controls? Uh, well, that's because the security boundaries that an attacker has to cross, uh, sorry, from a single pod, uh, a container to the underlying host are not really that many. And that's really due to the nature of containers, which as you know, are just processes running on the host system with a bunch of Linux magic namespaces, control groups, that kind of stuff, which make them believe they are running in a separate environment, but that's not really the case. So there are a few layers available. They need to be hardened as much as possible. Defense in depth is the guiding principle always. So I think we are done. Getting back to Francesco for the final remarks. Right, thank you, Marco. Um, and we like to finish these presentations with a nice collection of buzzwords. Um, cloud native and associated technologies can be actually very complex. Uh, and that's the nature of a, a cool new cutting edge technology on top of uh, many virtualization layers. Um, secure by design and secure by default are a must. And uh, the classic uh, security is everybody's responsibility. Again, everybody at that table as you threat model the system. And then uh, once again, threat mode, try to threat model everything at different levels of depth, of course. Uh, you may even threat model processes, cluster provisioning processes, see who is involved, what they do. And uh, try to uh, get to um, put in place a, a risk-driven tech expenditure, but very focused and tailored on your use cases and um, your cube cluster or clusters. Um, again, use a threat your threat model to derive the first security controls. Sometimes it's going to be very difficult to retrofit those. So play in advance, build a canary cluster, test, test, and test again, mitigate against those uh, most high impactful threats, and then start with the, uh, you know, mitigate the top five, and then start from number six to 10, and move in this order. And uh, all you need to do that is very, very likely, very likely, uh, either out of the box or uh, open source. And uh, with this, we would like to wrap up and uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, open the floor to Q&A. Okay. Grazie Francesco, grazie Marco. Grazie. Uh, il talk è stato veramente molto grazie interessante. Il libro l'ho anche messo nella wishlist, quindi visto che siamo vicini a Natale, magari ne approfitto. <laughs> um, so, um, I will ask in English, okay, because we have a, um, a question in English. So, Dario asked, uh, okay, uh, you see it in the screen. So, ain't you missing uh, the old four security policies that were providing more fine grade control? I can go with this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can go with this. Yeah, actually, I mentioned, I briefly mentioned about security policies when talking about security context and uh, uh, admission control. Uh, we, we are well aware of that uh, with our customers as well. And actually, uh, we are, we are, I mean, we are considering different options from migration to the old fine grained, but also kind of difficult to be applied to specific pods and namespaces for the way it was implemented in, in Kubernetes, the pod security policies approach. Uh, I can tell you that for now, I mean, uh, you either go, in my opinion, you either go for pod security admission where you really need uh, some basic levels, as you, as you know, because they aren't as fine grained as, as previously or what we typically see is also uh, migration to custom policy controllers. So you, you, you might want to use Caverno or uh, Gatekeeper to implement similar kind of uh, um, policies to the ones you had in pod security policies, which actually let you fine grade the individual parts of the security context of a pod. So I think, yeah, that those are the approaches. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we got another another question. Have you thought about solving security issues reported by Kubernetes benchmarks for uh, both the vanilla and managed CSD versions? Yeah. The, I mean, I, I could probably go with this as well. <laughs> uh, 
that's actually, I mean, what we do for a living. That, that's what I'd, I actually said since the beginning in a, in a slide where I was talking about CIS benchmarks. CIS benchmarks are just the guiding uh, guidelines for, for starting. They actually uh, help you have a baseline for security controls, but uh, both for the vanilla Kubernetes, for managed CSPs, there's actually much more to be done on that. And that's where threat modeling really comes into place because threat modeling might as well come when you have already a cluster which has implemented CIS benchmarks, but we will find attack paths for those as well. So there will still be controls. Yeah, this is, that is this, we call it a cyber hygiene. That's something you should do regardless. And um, maybe you can't deploy all the controls in the CS benchmark itself, um, but, but it is the starting point. And then you find additional controls, again, for the attacks more specific to your infrastructure. Okay. Ok, so thank you for your answers, uh, grazie per aver partecipato all'evento e niente, direi a questo punto di dare spazio ai vostri speaker e salutiamo Marco e Francesco di Controllo. Grazie mille. Alla prossima. Ciao, buona giornata a tutti.